He had told Barnabas all about it. He said, Barnabas, the most exciting thing happened to me. You know, when Ananias came to see me, you know what God said to me? God said, I'm to be the apostle of the Gentiles, Barnabas. That means that somehow this gospel, it's all tied up now in Jewish prejudice. It's all mixed up with Mosaic law and circumcision and, and, and meats and, and meat and fish on Friday and the whole bit. He, that it's somehow it's going to get released and, and it's going to... He, he, and I, I'm, I'm the one God's called me to do it, Barnabas. Barnabas said, that's wonderful, Paul. I, I believe that. Amen. The years start to go by. And God gets fed up. He said, I told Peter to get out into all the world. And he's sticking there in Jerusalem with the other apostles. They, they get around in Judea a little bit and made a little sally down into Samaria. But they're not getting on with the job. So he sent persecution and sent the people everywhere preaching the gospel except the apostles. He says, keep them at home. They get anywhere, they'll spoil the thing. We'll keep them home. <laughs> Some of them got as far as Antioch and they started to preach the gospel to the Hellenists down there and the Gentiles and they started to get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and the apostles heard about it and they said, hey, we better check that out. So they call the College of the Apostles together and they're all sitting there in, 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 in holy authority. God says, I'm going to have to get, move in on this thing. If they send the wrong fellow down there, I'm in trouble again. So he went around the circle of the apostles and he said, send Barnabas, send Barnabas, send Barnabas. So one of the apostles spoke up, he said, it seems to me the Lord is saying to me that we should send Barnabas. <laughs> Another apostle said, you know, it seemed to me the Lord is saying to me we should send Barnabas. You bet he was, he said it to all of them. So they unanimously voted to send Barnabas. Why? Because Barnabas was a good man. Now, the difference between a good man and a righteous man, a righteous man wants a hundred cents on the dollar. You go to a righteous man, if you've had a problem and you come to a righteous man, you say, brother, I'm in trouble. He says, what have you done? You tell me. He says, I've never done that. I've been an upright man. I pay my bills. So I'm sorry I can't help you. <laughs> so you go over here and you go to a good man. You say, I'm in trouble. What have you done? You tell him. Costa says, well, my precious brother, and this would be like Costa, too. Costa says, my precious brother, I, I've not been in that problem, but I love you. And I'm going to do what I can for you. That's a good man. And the Bible says, for a righteous man, who's going to die? But for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now, if I hear that fellow's in trouble, I'm not likely to go and pay his lawyer. But if I hear Cost is in trouble, I'm liable to cross land and sea. Because when I needed him, he didn't play self-righteous with me. Even though he was a righteous man, he was a good man. And Barnabas was a good man. He had elastic in his soul. Some Christians have no elastic. They're made of unbending iron. Miserable creatures. Cousins to the abomination of desolation. <laughs> Barnabas gets down to, to Antioch and he finds there is revival. And he saw the grace of God. The people were getting saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. No circumcision, no law of Moses, no prohibitions. This is marvelous. A light went on. Saul of Tarsus. He said, brethren, if you'll excuse me for a few days, I got a trip to make. Where he goes. Gets to Tarsus. He's been out of touch with Paul for 12 years. Gets to Tarsus, doesn't even know his address, hasn't even got his phone number. <laughs> so he says, uh, he, he goes around, he says, uh, uh, if you do you know where there's a, a little man with a um, um, he, 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 he makes tents. 
Somebody says, what have you going on and, and on and, and hit it? I'm on. I see that. <laughs> Sitting in front of a bazaar. There he is. Kick him. I'm not sure. 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 I'm What's he doing? Well, he's talking in tongues. Paul <laughs> talks in tongues all the time. You think tongues doesn't matter? I want to tell you something. Tongues is the greatest builder-upper that you've got. You just talk in tongues all the time. Except at 4 o'clock in the morning at a conference. I didn't love him so much, he wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> Barnabas says, Paul, Barnabas. Man, he's up there and in Barnabas' arm. Barnabas says, Paul, it's happened. Remember what you told me in Jerusalem? It's happened. A bunch of them went down from Jerusalem after the persecution went down to Antioch and the revival broke out and the apostles sent me down to check it out and I checked it out and just like you said it was going, it started. Paul said, thank God, hold it. I'll go get my toothbrush. I'll be right with you. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Some of you young people here tonight, you know, you expect to go to Bible school and come right out and become a stem winder. I want to tell you something. You're going to serve God and serve Him well. I know you are. Right from this day on, through school or whatever training you're going to take. But as Mr. Moody says, it takes 20 years to build a sermon. Don't be discouraged. Hold steady. For 30 years, the matchless, impeccable Son of God walked in obscurity and holiness before His heavenly Father who viewed him like the priest did in the long ago, who took his knife and opened up the very marrow of the bone to check the blood sources. For 30 years, Jesus proved himself to be what he was supposed to be. And then for just three and a half years, he moved out in that magnificent, truth-serving mission and ministry. Don't be impatient. God's teaching you to fly. God's teaching you to nest high. He's building high aspirations in you. Don't settle for something less. Satan will come along and offer you a substitute. Or even some good soul will suggest that you have an Ishmael to help God out. God doesn't need your help. Wait till your Isaac is born. You may think you're waiting too long. You're not waiting too long. God is never, never late for an appointment. His timings are always correct. If you walk patiently with God, everything will work out. And when Paul got down to Antioch, it wasn't long after he'd served there along with Barnabas and others that as they were ministering before the Lord in prayer and ministry, the Holy Ghost said, Separate Barnabas and Saul for the work we're into. I have called them. Years ago, as a young minister, I said to the Lord, when I'd be studying night after night and preaching to a little congregation and nobody knew I was around, I said, oh God, I can hardly wait for the day when I'm just so busy for you, I've got nothing to do but serve you. No, I won't even have time to study. I think I ought not to have prayed that prayer because that day has come and it will come. And use those years and use them wisely. God is building into you lofty ideals. There is so much about Christian work today that is shoddy. There's so much about Christian work today that is questionable. There's so much about Christian work today that cuts corners. I think if there's one thing that appeals to me about what I have seen, in world map, it has been the very statistic that Brother Ralph was able to give tonight. 